Welcome back to E3 Rehab. I'm Dr. Tony Camella, physical therapist. And in today's video, I'm gonna be discussing carpal tunnel syndrome. While I will briefly review some strategies aimed towards self-management, I wanna first discuss what this condition is and what are some of the key signs and symptoms commonly associated with this diagnosis. I'm also gonna be talking about differential diagnoses. So in other words, if it's not carpal tunnel syndrome, what else could it potentially be? This is a really important part of the conversation because it's really gonna help guide treatment decisions as well as prognosis. Let's start it off with some basic background information and anatomy to get you more familiar with carpal tunnel syndrome. The carpal tunnel is a narrow passageway located on the palmar side of your hand and wrist and is formed by the transverse carpal ligament on one side and the carpal bones on the other. Within this passageway runs the median nerve and multiple flexor tendons. These include the flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus, the flexor pollicis longus, and the flexor carpe radialis. The median nerve innervates your three thumb muscles, the flexor pollicis brevis, abductor pollicis brevis, and opponent's pollicis, as well as two hand muscles called the lumbricals. This nerve is also responsible for sensation on the palmar lateral aspect of your hand and palmar side of the thumb, pointer finger, middle finger, and lateral half of the ring finger. Carpal tunnel syndrome may be triggered by activities which place the hand and wrist in extreme positions, such as with bending, extending, or gripping, or which involve repetitive wrist motions, such as with manual jobs and typing. These activities may lead to swelling or increased pressure within the carpal tunnel, which may cause the median nerve to become compressed or irritated. It is often characterized by pain, paresthesia, tingling, and or numbness along the median nerve distribution in the hand and fingers, and has a tendency to worsen at night. In more severe cases, it can lead to muscular weakness and atrophy of the thumb muscles. While these are common complaints, there are other signs and symptoms to be aware of. The findings from a clinical exam can either increase our suspicion of carpal tunnel syndrome and lead to its respective treatment, it may reduce suspicion and lead to the possibility of another diagnosis, or it may warrant further medical testing. In 2006, Graham and colleagues developed a diagnostic criteria that estimates the probability of carpal tunnel syndrome based on the presence or absence of six clinical findings. This is called the CTS-6, and it includes numbness or tingling present along the sensory distribution of the median nerve, nocturnal numbness, symptoms are most prominent during sleep and numbness wakes you from sleep, weakness and or atrophy of the thenar muscles. This can be observed by reduced muscle bulk of the thenar area or muscle testing showing a decrease in strength, a positive Phelan's test, flexion of the wrist reproduces or makes symptoms of numbness worse along the median nerve distribution, a positive Tonell sign, light tapping over the median nerve causes radiating paresthesia into fingers or the territory innervated by the median nerve, and a loss of two-point discrimination, a failure to discriminate two points held five millimeters or less apart from one another over the digits innervated by the median nerve. Based on these findings, you can be categorized as having a high, low, or intermediate probability of carpal tunnel syndrome. Authors concluded that if the results from the CTS-6 deem there's a high probability, electrodiagnostic tests are not likely to add much greater certainty to the diagnosis. If there is a low probability, it would be appropriate to consider a different diagnosis. And if the results are somewhere in between, it may indicate a need for electrodiagnostic testing since results can influence decision-making about treatment. In 2008, Graham further supported the clinical use of the CTS-6 by concluding, electrodiagnostic testing does not change the probability of diagnosing carpal tunnel syndrome to any substantial degree because the probability estimated clinically with the CTS-6 is already very high. This information tells us that a clinical exam might be sufficient in many cases. However, some will still benefit from further testing. And this information is not meant to serve as medical advice. So it's strongly advisable that you consult with your doctor if you have questions pertaining to your individual needs. Now, if the clinical exam reveals low probability, this is where consideration of another condition is really important as it will likely alter treatment and management. There are a handful of other conditions which will present similarly to that of carpal tunnel syndrome. Some of the more notable ones are cervical radiculopathy, thoracic outlet syndrome, and other peripheral nerve issues. 
I'm not gonna explain each one of these thoroughly, but I do wanna identify a few characteristics which differ from that of carpal tunnel syndrome. However, if you do want us to cover one of these topics in more detail, just let us know in the comments below. Cervical radiculopathy. This involves nerve irritation at the neck level. This might present with neck pain, exacerbation of symptoms with neck movement, radiating pain from the neck to the shoulder or arm, reduced reflexes, weakness in proximal arm muscles, and or sensory loss in areas not typically seen in carpal tunnel syndrome. Brachial plexopathy. This is in reference to irritation of any of the nerves of the brachial plexus. Exams will typically reveal weakness, sensory loss, or diminished reflexes outside the median nerve. Thoracic outlet syndrome. The exact pathoanatomy of the condition isn't very clear, but something ends up causing some level of compression on the structures in the region between our first rib and collarbone. If you want to learn more about that topic, we covered that in a separate YouTube video, and you can find that link in the description box below. Other peripheral nerve issues to be aware of are the radial and ulnar nerve, which will present with different distribution of symptoms. The literature also suggests that pronator syndrome and anterior interosseous nerve syndrome are other median nerve issues that mimic that of carpal tunnel syndrome. However, these are much more rare. Lee and Lesteo compared these two conditions to carpal tunnel syndrome and found some key differences. Both of these will usually lack nocturnal symptoms and may present with pain in the front part of the forearm. Furthermore, the anterior interosseous nerve is a motor nerve, so it will lack paresthesia symptoms and present with weakness, which can make writing and picking up objects harder. Late stages may show a positive pinch test, where there is hyperextension in the finger and reduced ability to bend the thumb. Again, as a disclaimer, this is not medical advice, and the list I just mentioned is not exclusive, meaning there can be other diagnoses to consider. Furthermore, it should be noted that signs and symptoms can be exacerbated or triggered by other conditions, such as diabetes, nutritional deficiencies, rheumatoid arthritis, pregnancy, and others. So if you have questions pertaining to your individual case, it is strongly advisable you consult with your doctor or another healthcare practitioner. In the final part of this video, I'm going to briefly touch on a few strategies aimed towards self-management. In article titled Conservative Interventions for Carpal Tunnel Syndrome, the author provides some simple and practical suggestions. It has been found that wrist flexion and extension, full supination, finger flexion against resistance, external pressure on the palm, and sustained grip all increase pressure within the carpal tunnel. Therefore, activity modification, which alters wrist and forearm position, reduces repetitive gripping activities, and decreases pressure on the wrist are all really important for managing symptoms. A splint is another consideration since it can help avoid aggravating activities and positions. There actually isn't a consensus on how long to wear the splint, as this has varied across studies, but the general recommendation is that it should be worn at night, and we want it to hold our wrist in this neutral position. So we don't want the wrist flexed, we don't want it extended, but rather neutral, since this has shown to place the least amount of pressure on the carpal tunnel. And finally, exercises such as nerve and tendon glides may help alleviate symptoms, as well as provide an opportunity for you to break up prolonged wrist and hand positions. If you want us to do a video more in depth on the treatment and exercise options for carpal tunnel syndrome, let us know in the comments below. Although carpal tunnel can affect three to 5% of the population, there really isn't a gold standard for diagnosing it, nor is there a consensus on the best diagnostic criteria. However, the CTS-6 does allow us to increase our suspicion on whether or not someone has carpal tunnel syndrome, which can help guide treatment. If we do not suspect symptoms are due to carpal tunnel syndrome, it is worth being aware of differential diagnoses so we can reduce delay of appropriate treatment and management, as well as reduce discomfort and unnecessary expenses. That's all we have for today's video, but like I mentioned earlier, if there's any other content you want us to cover, just drop it in the comments below. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to our channel, and if you wanna check out our other content, visit our website at e3rehab.com. We'll see you guys next time. Peace.